Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor. It is 7 o'clock in the morning and um, I'm, I've got my coffee here. I'm ready to roll. Wanted to let you know I've been making a few videos just because I think things are getting very interesting. I've been making some longer than normal videos. I'm going to try to get them back down, but this video is going to be a little longer because I've got some video, a few, uh, like a string of videos I want to tie together for you. I think you'll find very interesting. Let's start with Chinu Patel at Chinu Patel 29. He sent us this. Um, this is from XRP Stewart. It's a great find. Uh, this is one of the, um, uh, they found one of the, uh, Stewart found one of the market makers for XRP. Listen up. I'm going to give you a little overview of GSR. We are 35 employees. We started in November 2013. Um, we started being primary market makers for Ripple, and since then we've provided market making services for exchanges, um, token issuers, and um, we've also, what we have right now, it's um, a company that serves not only providing liquidity to the market, but also sourcing liquidity to the market. We have an OTC desk, and we execute programmatic um, selling, buying, or programs to our customers. In many occasions, um, we find ourselves with customers that come to us. They have advised ICOs. They are ICOs, founders, or whales with large amounts. The main thing I wanted you to hear there was that, that he is a market maker for Ripple. And I, I, don't, I don't know that anyone knew who the market makers were until this video. So good for Stuart. Um, I'm going to move along here. I want to get to the core of this video. The large, uh, this is Michael at BAL Five Links. The largest cryptocurrency exchange by trading volume has applied for an operating license in Singapore. I think Singapore is just now getting their regulations in place for crypto, and I think that's why he's gone and done. CZ Binance, the CEO, has gone and applied for his license there. Okay, XRP Honey Bear. This is where it starts to get a little interesting here, folks. XRP Honey Bear sent me this. Now, this is a tweet from Charles Hoskinson, who is the creator of Cardano. Um, he says, nothing like having the treasure, Treasury Secretary go after your industry. Gl um, glad your last significant crackdowns to guns, porn, and gambling have resulted in the end of those industries. Enjoy the waste bin of history. Now, um, I want to show you what, this is an article where Steve Mnuchin, and before I go any further, I want to remind you, remember, Steve Mnuchin, uh, I think he created CIT Bank. The attorney for Ripple, Stu, Stu, the general counsel for Ripple, Stuart Alderati, was appointed as the, attorney, the, the general counsel for CIT Bank while Steve Mnuchin was on the board at CIT Bank. Steve Mnuchin then left to go to Treasury Secretary, and then later on, Alderati leaves CIT Bank to become Ripple's general counsel. That's an important thing for you all to know. Um, blow to bit, but this is this is what Charles Hoskinson was was and was um, referring to, and I want to make sure you understand. Um, blow to Bitcoin, a significant U.S. crypto crackdown suddenly revealed. Now, this is, in, I believe, the title's intended to scare you, but let's get further into it. Um, this week, the Treasury Secretary warned significant new Bitcoin and cryptocurrency regulations are on their way. Um, if you're a part of Ripple and XRP and an investor in XRP, you know that this is not, they're not talking to us <laughs> if, if you've been around for a while. But I'll show you a little more about this. Um, Reserve President Neil, and then they they th they added in the they, first. This is really about Steve Mnuchin and how there's going to be regulations come out. We already knew that, but then they added in that Minip Minneapolis Federal Reserve President Neil Kashkari branded cryptocurrencies a giant garbage dumpster, and the Department of Just Justice called Bitcoin mixing a crime. I had never heard this term. Maybe I should have, but I hadn't. So I decided to go and look at what 
bit what is bitcoin mixing um and this is an article from february 14th this is from valentine's day this year um where the doj calls bitcoin mixing a crime arrest of software developer um and let's see it says basically his uh this guy from coin ninja was create created the bitcoin mixer helix which sends transactions out in mixed batches so individual payments are harder to trace um, helix enabled customers for a fee to send bitcoins to designed recipients in a manner which was de uh, designed to conceal and op obfuscate the source of the owner of the bitcoins the indictment continues this type of service is commonly referred to as a bitcoin mixer so um the person that wrote the forbes article i believe intentionally mixed two totally separate things well, it's never been thought that, um, I mean, I've told you on this channel a lot, that that any digital asset uh, that seeks to, to create privacy, like a Monero, I've told you, I don't touch those things. Any of these privacy coins that that's are designed for the purpose of hiding money are going to be gone after us. That's the fact, okay? That's just the way it is. Um, I've told you to stay away from that type of stuff. And what this guy was doing was obviously underhanded type stuff. Well, that's a totally separate thing from crypto as a whole, and, and especially Ripple and XRP. So I wanted to show you this. Now this, just to, just to reinforce the point, this is the reason I chose XRP back in 2013. It's the reason I've been telling you that XRP is the one. It's the reason that it was the smart play. Just listen here. What do you think that, that you would like to see from financial institutions and governments knowing that you work with both very closely? I, I love this question in part because I think it is so important that the industry is proactive in engaging regulators. I think you know, many in the industry are quick to blame regulators. Uh, as one manifestation of this, uh, Ripple brought together uh, about 30 plus central banks from around the world. Uh, I think it was two weeks ago, yesterday or the day before, my time zones are screwed up. But uh, in New York City, we had a, a private meeting uh, where it was, you know, 20% it was talking about what Ripple is doing and socializing with central banks from around the world, what Ripple is doing. But 80% of it was letting the central banks talk to each other. We have found that when we're meeting one-on-one -on -one with central banks that we're having a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, they want to understand what other central banks are thinking about blockchain. What are they thinking about crypto? What are they thinking about the, the risks, the pros and cons to some of the evolutions? And so for us, it was let's create a catalyst to bring them together and talk about it. And yes, provide, we were one participant, but it was important, frankly, it was a private event because I think it was easier to be uh, open and direct about what's going on around the world. But I think we all should need to be proactive. And I think those that you know, like to throw the regulators under the bus and say they're stymieing innovation, they're slowing things down. To your point, they provide a critical piece to you know, the, the stability and you know, mitigating fraud. And these are things that matter, whether it's blockchain or other digital assets, that they matter. And what do you... Okay. And then I wanted to show you this, because remember, <clears throat> that was Steve Mnuchin that came out and talked about this regulatory crackdown on cryptocurrency. If you haven't seen it, I've shown this on this channel before. You need to go watch this video. This is by SPQR Media. These guys do deep dives. They do really good research. Um, Game Set Match is the video that he did. Well, his crescendo at the end, and go subscribe to him if you have not. His, his crescendo at the end of the video is when he showed you the appointment book, <laughs> the appointment book of the Treasury Secretary, Steve Mnuchin. And it just so happens that from 10.15 to 10.45 a.m., the Treasury Secretary was meeting with Brad Garlinghouse, Ripple CEO. <laughs> so the, I, thought, I always thought that was just a great video that he did. So go watch that and give him a subscribe. Um, so... That's what we're dealing with here. That's the difference between Ripple and, and XRP and a Bitcoin or whatever. So I just want, I thought it was important to give you some background when you're reading these news articles that are supposedly going to be real scary for all of us. Okay. And then uh, there was this from Passive Wealth. You know crypto is a thing when your government asks if you have invested in crypto. Um, did the SMSF own any cryptocurrencies as an investment? And this is some kind of Australian tax office document. 
Okay, now, now I want to take you into the real meat of this video. I want to show you the big picture, okay? Now, I'm going to play you some video. I'm going to play, I don't normally play this much of video, but I want you to hear every seven minutes of this video right here. Okay, and this is from Michael at VAL 5 Links and Darren Moore Jr., who you can also subscribe to Darren Moore Jr.'s, um, his, uh, Darren Moore Jr.'s um, web, not website, YouTube channel. Go give him a subscribe. And he's also on, um, he's also on, on Twitter, a definite follow. Listen to every word of this, folks, every single word. To digital currency. And so I want to get your view on digital currency if you think that's, and to be specific, uh, a government backed digital currency. If you think that's the direction that we're going, if you do think that's the direction you're going, uh, do you think that they'd do that for to implement negative interest rates or they well, that's would do what that? They're to talking have, about. Oh, great. Let me get your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, the, I love the IMF is one of my favorite websites because I get reports from all, all the time. And uh, they've already in 2015, they laid out how they could take us cashless, get us to volunteer to go cashless within weeks, their words, not mine, of the next financial crisis because they could do it at the central bank window. And what they would do is they would you know, when you would go to, uh, they want the retail public to distribute that to the general public because they want distance between their policy choices and how you see it. So you don't equate the two. But what they talked about is if you go in to buy a cup of coffee at Starbucks, if you, if you use your debit card or credit card or your phone, it'll be five bucks. If you use cash, it'll be six bucks. Mm. What are you likely to do? You're going to use this. You're not going to want to pay this. If you go to withdraw money from your account, there'll be a fee attached to it. It'll cost you 20 bucks to take out a hundred or whatever. If you go to deposit it, there's going to be a fee attached, right? So they're going to make you volunteer the cash. And because it is you, you perceive that it's your choice. You do not blame them, but they need to go negative. They need to go negative. So let me just stay on cash for a minute. Sure, sure. Uh, a more current uh, piece on taking us cashless was on how to take us into deeply negative rates, into deeply negative rates, not little teeny negative rates, but deeply negative rates. And that was uh, regarding cash, they would put a chip in the cash so that rather than charging you that um, overtly, when it would track whatever their negative rate was, and whenever you went to use it or deposit it, it would reflect that negative rate. So for those viewers that are thinking, because for me, I think cash is the first line of defense because that's what people are used to. You know, right. yes, it loses all value, but that's still what people are used to. So they call the current cash that's out there now cash in the wild. And it would carry a premium because it doesn't have the chip yet. Mm. So for those, I mean, really, I created a strategy for myself based upon uh, the normal life cycle of a currency and how that works. And so everybody here, all of our precious metals consultants have been trained in that strategy. And so there's a certain level of cash. There's a certain level of barterability. There's a certain level of growth. Depends on what you're doing and, and all of that. But cash is certainly part of it. So if anybody is considering that, they probably want to get their cash out of the system sooner than later while it's still cash in the wild, which, right. okay. But going back to it would be a government, um, you want to call it backed or I, I would say mandated right. currency in, in digital form. And the IMF is actually talking about having uh, a retail SDR mm. and as well as a 
which would be for you and me right. versus a wholesale SDR, which would be, um, you know, for the banks. And I, I do think that's the direction we're going in, not a Bitcoin or any of those, but it will be government mandated. Watch China. You know, we're kind of waiting for them to come out with the first government uh, digital currency. But yeah, because if they want you to spend money and all of a sudden you look at your bank account today and you got a thousand bucks in it. OK, tomorrow you got nine hundred. The day after you got eight hundred. Well, what are you likely to do? You're likely to go put it into anything that you think can hold its value. Right better than the currency and that's hyperinflation whether it's hyperdeflation or hyperinflation it's the same thing it doesn't matter mm. yeah, so, that, that, yeah that's a great point i never thought about that with them putting the the chip in the actual piece of paper so if you used it you wouldn't get the value that was on you wouldn't get the nominal value so if you go correct. to starbucks and you're your coffee is a dollar, let's say, if you used a piece of paper, it would only give you a, a credit for 95 cents or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. That's Brilliant, very... isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to yeah. give credit. I mean, it's evil genius. Yeah, right. But look, right. these guys have had <laughs> hundreds of years, well, at least a hundred and some years to know how to do this. And when you read their documents, they refer back to 1913. And the way that they do it then, that's the way they did it then, the way they did it in the 70s, is they keep things looking as normal as possible. So I can tell you, in July of 1971, I had a $20 bill in my pocket. In September of 1971, I got another $20 bill in my pocket. When you look at both those bills, even if it's an old one versus a brand new one then, they look almost identical not quite there's a little tweak in there but unless you were really examining that you wouldn't notice it just like the gold certificate in 1912 and the federal reserve note in 1914 they look very very similar yeah. so you you just and they keep the name right you know they're there and my bet will be that we're going to end up with two a local one so the Fed, so maybe the Fed coin or the U.S. dollar coin or something like that, probably the dollar coin, because that's what people are used to, as well as the SDRs, which is where they really want to hold your title to all, all of your wealth. So there you go. Well, I watched that and I thought that was just fascinating. <clears throat> and I was curious and started looking at trying to look for different things with this Lynette Zhang, who is the lady that you just saw. So um, when I did that, and by the way, go get Darren Moore subscribe. He he deserves it. Um, and that's his YouTube channel right there. It's uh, Darren Moore Jr. is his YouTube channel. So I went and looked for some more things from Lynette Zhang, and this popped up. This is Jim Rickards, um, and this he's the gold guy that you've seen for years now. Um, and I want you to see this and starting, I wrote down where to start. Okay, this is about where I wanted to start it from. I want you to listen closely. This all kind of ties together. And I want you to listen very closely to what he says, because this guy's very connected. He's like like an economic uh, genius, and he's uh, he, he advises very important um, people around the world. And Okay, had a little bit of a computer hiccup there. Let's try this again. Intelligence, they worked around us and then ultimately disbanded our group, but that was partly uh, that it was occurring at the same time as this uranium deal. So uh, I talked about that. I was uh, actually targeted for recruitment by a couple of Russian spies uh, So over drinks at the Font Blue Hotel in Miami. You know, so I talked about that. I, of course, I contacted counterintelligence and, and, and uh, alerted them to these people immediately. So... Uh, hopefully they got what was coming to them. But um, my point being, there's, there's a lot else uh, in the book, but with, yeah. specifically with regard to Tim Geithner, I had a, a private one-on-one -on -one conversation with him um, in, uh, in Manhattan, and um, I had worked up a thesis, which I think is valid, that uh, you know, in 1998, Wall Street bailed out the hedge fund, long-term capital management, and I, I negotiated that deal. In 2008, 
central banks bail out Wall Street. You know, Bear Stearns failed, Fannie Mae failed, Freddie Mac failed, Lehman failed. The, you know, Morgan Stanley was days away from failing. Goldman would have been next, then Citi, et cetera. Well, the Fed bailed out the um, uh, Wall Street. Well, the next time, the next crisis, and it's coming sooner than later, who's going to bail out the central banks? All they do, they keep moving the problem upstairs, some hedge funds to Wall Street, to central banks. Who's going to bail out the central bank? Well, the only clean balance sheet left is the IMF. Uh, so, uh, and, and Geithner was um, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, secretary of the Treasury, but he also worked at the IMF on, uh, on occasion. So I asked him, I said, uh, um, you know, I, I think the Fed's at the limit of what they can do. They printed their way out of the last one. I'm not sure they could print their way out of the next crisis because they've never cleaned up their balance sheet. And the IMF could issue, say, a trillion SDRs that would be worth about you know, $1.5 trillion and hand them out to the members. It's just world money. It's a, it's a world printing press and world money, um, now under the control of an American, by the way, David Lipton, since uh, Christine Lagarde has left to become the head of the ECB. Uh, I so, there you go. Uh, in a financial crisis, the IMF is the last place that, it, that could handle anything. So, keep following me here. So, um, and then he mentioned the other thing important in there that he mentioned, he said, now you've got an American that runs the IMF, David Lipton. So I decided to go look for David Lipton. Here's the beginning of it. And then I wanted to show you here at 527. Let me do a refresh here and we can get this uh, going right. This is from someone that tweeted this out back in July. Um, so, and this is also Darren Moore, by the way, give him credit again. The hubs of economic activity will shift over the coming decades. New financial centers will grow in importance. New reserve currencies may well emerge. Throughout all of that, it's- <laughs> New reserve currencies may emerge, but let's, let's go to 527 now and let you hear this part. And, and others proposals for what they call the Libra coin. These new instruments aim to do for transactions what the internet has done for information, which is to make uh, transactions instantaneous, secure, and nearly free. Who does that sound like? Yesterday, we published a new paper that highlights the benefits. Okay, and I wanted to bring one more little thing to your attention, folks. This was Bretton Woods 75 years later. Just thought that was worthy of mentioning. Now, keep following this. So now you got this. Uh, this is the guy running the IMF. This should all start to come together. Then you got this I showed you, I believe, yesterday. This is an oldie but goodie. You can never watch this too many times. Is 10 years out on the financial crisis. We still don't have the infrastructure, perhaps, to prevent the next one. And I think this is where digital assets can really help because an efficient digital asset uh, can really solve um, some of the key problems in global liquidity. You know, the world's got trillions and trillions of dollars tied up in liquidity just to get around how clunky the movement of value is around the world. If with a really efficient digital asset, something like XR XRP, again, that's what we believe will be the, the, the most efficient, um, you can now reduce trillions and trillions of capital from being tied up. So you can make those transfers instantly as a bank or as a payment provider or as an enterprise without having to have money pre-positioned all over the world. So that's... Okay. And then finally, um, for those, this is, and remember folks, I know a lot of you have already seen some of these videos, but there's a lot of new people coming in and I'm trying to make sure I show them what you and I already know. And I'm, that's why I'm tying all this together. And then there's this oldie but goodie. This is one of the best. This is Brad Growinghouse on stage with Ross Lecklow, who used to, who was the IMF, um, I believe he was their general counsel or something, but listen up very closely and not even specific to ripple or to xrp oh, let me do a refresh uh, sorry it's time to get a new computer specific to ripple or to xrp's uh community i think one of the things that will surprise us a year from now is that banks will be custodying digital assets directly 
And I think right now we think about that and think, look, there's no way that's going to happen. Uh, they're too conservative. And I think what you're seeing is you know, two things happening. One is banks are seeing that a lot of money is being made by digital asset exchanges globally, and banks are profit motivated. Uh, the second, and as we've talked about up here, so Ross has made very clear, is regulatory clarity and regulatory frameworks enable banks and financial institutions to lean into these markets. And I think uh, we will surprise ourselves by this time. Uh, and it, but I'll also predict that it will be banks in the ASEAN markets where there is this regulatory clarity and there is a lot of progressive uh, forward thinking. They'll be the first to actually allow for uh, crypto assets uh, custody in their accounts. All right, with that, we'll turn it over to questions. And I see a bunch of questions on this screen, which I can't really read from here, but we're supposed to pick some. Watch closely uh, now, folks. Can you see those? One of the best pieces of video There's ever. two votes. Let me try. Do you see <laughs> IMF holding crypto assets in the future? Oh, sh They're over here. That's easier. I just want you, before you finish watching this, I want you to note, look at the body language on both of these guys. Brad Darlinghouse has never looked more, he looks almost cocky in this, in this clip, that kind of confidence. And the other guy looks extremely uncomfortable, like it's right there, but he can't say it. You want to take one? Go for it. The first one's for you. IMF. Do you see IMF holding crypto assets in the future? I did not put that up there. Remember, I'm from the legal department. I'm supposed to be very conservative about these things. Um, I, I don't want to go into great details about Maybe the Maybe I should take what the IMF yeah, is going to uh, do. Uh, I think we uh, stunned uh, Ross into silence with that one. For that to happen, okay, under the current legal framework, some country would have to use a crypto asset as its currency. So anyway, what's, to me what's so important about that clip is that Brad Garlinghouse is as comfortable as you see him in this clip in putting that guy on the spot like that and having that conversation right there in front of everybody. If he's that com if he's that confident in public, <laughs> what are they talking about behind the scenes? That's what's going through my mind. Okay, we're going to move along now. But I think that I think that I pretty well tied to it. Should have what I just showed you that series of videos should pretty well tie together in your mind how just how big a deal ripple and xrp are because that is how big we're that that what 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 i just tied together for you was the big big picture and it is as big as you think it is um and i've been studying this since 2013 and i did not i did not when when i first got into this i just said oh okay this xrp looks like the best one but um, and it's, it's a new asset class, and so there will be a lot of speculators come in, and I'll make a lot of money. That's what I used to think. Over time, I had learned that how, just how much more significant all this is. It was all planned, folks. So Sergeant Obi-Wan sent me this. Now, this is also fascinating. I'm sorry the video is so long, but I hope it's worth it, and I think it is. Um, this person, XRP Gonza, says, everyone shut up and read this. MoneyGram is confirming our hopes and dreams right here. What an amazing statement. This is why XRP will take us to the moon. Now, what he's showing here, there's an article that was put out, and I believe the article was intentionally, here's the article, it was intentionally written in this way. MoneyGram reveals real-time remittance tech based on Visa, not Ripple. In other words, this guy's intentionally trying to put that spin. But the Gonzo person here is saying, look, this is right out of the article. Today, MoneyGram is utilizing Ripple's on-demand liquidity product, which allows MoneyGram to trade FX at a corporate level using XRP. It, it's a back-end treasury function that's not consumer-facing. The technology is helping to solve the most expensive and time-consuming aspect of the current process by reducing the amount of money the company needs to park around the world, which will eventually reduce working capital needs. My question to you all is, first two, I have two questions. The first question is, if this is this significant for MoneyGram, then isn't it also going to be significant for anybody that's dealing in FX around the world? If it's this significant um, and, it, and it helps them, um, like here they say, 
consuming aspect of the current process by reducing the amount of money the company needs to park around the world, which will eventually reduce working capital needs. Well, if it reduces working capital needs for MoneyGram, is it not going to reduce working capital needs for everyone around the world who's in FX? Or let's say it was even 10 or 20 percent, because the second question I have to you is, do you know how big the FX market is? I went and looked it up for you so I could show you. So let's say that um, if it's reducing the working capital needs for MoneyGram, let's say that it's doing that for only, let's say, they get 10% of the FX market around the world. Well, that would be 10% of $5.3 trillion, folks. And there's what, 10 or 11, 12 billion dollars in XRP today? You do the math, folks. Okay, and then I want to show you a couple of economic things. Uh, Jesse Colombo, the Bloomberg US startup barometer is plunging. The startup bubble is bursting, which is the scenario I learned about last year. And then there's this from Chinu Patel at Chinu Patel 29, breaking Japan's economy shrank by the most in more than five years last quarter, fueling recession concerns. GDP fell at an annualized pace of 6.3% from the previous quarter. And finally, I want to finish this video with this quote, and I'm sorry if some of you think it's too long, but I think it was a good one. This is from Bill Veek. I don't want the natural athlete. I want the guy who'll go after the hard ones. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe and hit the like button and tell your friends and family that the digital asset investor goes after the hard ones. And if you want to be successful in life, you should be willing, be the kind of person that is willing to go after the hard ones because those are the people who make it. Thank you for listening. Oh,